Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for being here today. We're so excited to have everyone here for the Winter Institute and thank you for braving the cold this morning. I'm Lynn MacDonald. I'm the director of the Winter Institute and a professor of economics here at St. Cloud State today. And we are so excited to invite you to be here on behalf of the School of Public Affairs, the Department of Economics, and the Center for Economic Education. So thank you for joining us. I want to also thank our sesquicentennial, our celebration partners for making today possible. Uh, thank you to Chartwells, Granite Equity Partners, Geocom, DeZurich, and Microbiologics. So thank you all for being here, and I want to welcome up to the stage uh, Mohammed, Hamza, and Jasmine, who will be our student MCs this morning. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Hamza. Um, I'm a business economics major at the School of Public Affairs and an information systems major. My name is Jasmine Thomas. I'm a finance major with a minor in economics offered through the School of Public Affairs. And my name is Mohammed, and I'm a senior major in economics at the School of Public Affairs. So we're going to start this off uh, with three very special giveaways. We've got three t-shirts. Uh, the last one is the Winter Institute t-shirt, so you better answer that question we asked. So the first question for the Winter is, is that the Winter Institute shirt? OK. OK. So who can tell us which Winter Institute is this? Like, how many years has Winter Institute been going on? OK, no, you are supposed to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, raise your hand, and then I'll choose you, and then you get the shirt. Okay, we'll do this again. No professors. <laughs> okay, we'll do this again. Which anniversary is our school celebrating this year? You. It's a lot of sir. hands. There you go. He gets, uh, he gets the Winter Institute shirt, guys. I'm sorry. You guys were slow. Um, <laughs> Got it. Jasmine, he has the next question for the next year. Oh, okay. This one is about one of our speakers today. So, what university did Professor Borjas get his PhD? Who wants to choose? Yeah. In the front? <laughs> what Col school? That is right. Yeah. Hey. Throw her the t shirt. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. You want it? Can we play catch? Good. All right, so for the last question, the last t-shirt, so please be ready, guys. Which university is Professor Brian Kaplan a professor in? Wrong. That, that's Professor Borjas. Any other people who want to? Yes. Yes, you got it. Thank you. Um, he gets a shirt, too. OK, thank you so much for your participation. Congratulations to all the t-shirt winners. So we let Jasmine kick off, um, and let's get started with the speakers. OK, great. Um, so again, I would like to thank everyone for being in attendance to the 57th Annual Winter Institute, despite the amazing winter weather that we get here in Minnesota. I know it's great. <laughs> So again, my name is Jasmine Thomas. I'm a finance major here with the econ minor through the School of Public Affairs. And I was given the great opportunity of introducing our first speaker. He was listed in Politico as one of the top thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics for telling it like it is when it comes to immigration. He received his PhD um, in economics from Columbia University and currently is the Robert W. Scrivener Professor of Economics and Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is author of several books, including, but not limited to, Immigration Economics, Heaven's Door, Immigration Policy and the American Economy, the widely used textbook, Labor Economics, now in its seventh edition, and a newfound favorite of mine, We Wanted Workers. Professor Borjas's research on the economic impact of immigration is widely perceived as playing a central role in the debate over immigration policy in the United States as well as abroad. He is described as America's leading immigration economist. Please help me welcome to the stage Professor George Borjas.
and thank you for bringing this weather into my life <laughs> today. Uh, I will go home knowing that I've now been in the coldest day of my life today, here today. Um, so I took a picture of the, of the temperature this morning and sent it to my family just to prove that I've survived a minus 15 degree day weather, okay? Uh, anyway, so what I want to talk about today is immigration. And uh, uh, let, me, let me get started by basically um, telling you the way that most economists would sort of approach the topic, okay? And most economists think at some conceptual, intuitive level of immigration being like trade, okay? And the reason that they think that is that when you import a widget into the U.S., it's sort of like importing the people who produce that widget, right? Like a widget might take uh, 10 hours of some kind of worker, 15 hours of another kind of worker. You import the widget, it's like importing the labor that these people are, are, are you know, are making the widget with, except that you're making the widget domestically uh, when you, um, when you're making the widget in a, in a foreign country when you import the widget, but with immigrants you're actually importing the people that produce that widget, as opposed to the actual widget itself. And once you think about it that way, then all the costs and benefits for immigration really come from the time that the immigrants spend on the production line to make widgets, right? It's just like the same kind of thing. And uh, in the usual way that economists think about, immigrants have no other role in society, basically. It's just, just, they just come in, they go to the factory, they produce widgets, and that's the end of the story. And uh, at least until recently, it was a, a mantra in economics that trade is good. No matter what, you could never say anything bad about trade. Trade is good. And since immigration is like trade, just importing the people to produce the widget here rather than there, it must follow that immigration is good as well. So that was the usual way that most economists would have approached the immigration topic, and still do, by the way. Uh, I think it's all wrong, okay? And uh, Max Frisch, who's a, who's a Swiss writer, was reflecting on the Turkish migration to Germany back in the 1950s, 1960s, and he came up with a quip that I think is the smartest thing anybody has ever said about immigration. And that is that quote there in bold, we wanted workers, but we got people instead. Uh, and you know that differentiation between workers and people is really the differentiate. It's really what makes trade different from immigration. And uh, basically, what Max Frisch was talking about is that immigrants have life outside the widget factory, and that calculating the the impact of immigration requires that you look at basically what it is about immigration that differentiates people from workers. Immigrants, people in general, act in particular ways because it is profitable to do certain things and to avoid other things, which don't have that kind of purposive kind of behavior. So immigrants are different. And uh, those decisions that immigrants make as human beings have repercussions of all kinds. And those repercussions could actually make the impact of immigration much more beneficial than what we would think it to be, or it could make it much worse than what we would think it to be. We just don't know. But we have to take into account that because immigrants are people, they're going to make choices and decisions that can either make the gains greater or that can make the losses much more negative. And just to give you an example of what I mean by that, people choose to migrate. It's not robots that basically migrate, people choose to migrate. Some people choose not to migrate. And that self-selection matters. And it particularly matters when a country might realize that the people that are choosing to migrate to those country, as Obi-Wan Kenobi would say, those were not the people we're looking for, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is that there are some people that a country might welcome, some people that a country might not welcome, and it really matters in terms of the impact which people chose to migrate. Even from Mexico, for example, only 10% of Mexicans have gone to the US. 90% have chosen not to come to the US. Now you could say it's policy, it's hard to move, and so on, and that's true. But think of Puerto Rico, for example. In Puerto Rico, about a third of the people have moved out of Puerto Rico into the US. There are no legal restrictions to move from Puerto Rico to the US, and surely the third who moved 
are different from the two-thirds that didn't move. And the impact of that migration will depend on which third and which two-thirds we're talking about. So that's one problem that we need to consider when we talk about the impact of immigration. The second is, one immig once immigrants come to the country or get to the country, they decide whether to assimilate or not. Assimilation is not something that happens automatically. Just think of learning the language. You know, it doesn't happen just because you're floating around the air, you know, and picking it all up. You have to work at it. You have to take lessons. You have to practice it. And all kinds of things will happen that, you know, all kinds of costs and benefits come up that might lead some immigrants to, to, to make those choices to assimilate and some immigrants not to make those choices to assimilate. And that matters. Third is, immigrants, unlike wages, were ethnic labels. And even though economists don't really admit to the whole concept of ethnicity very often, ethnicity matters. And ethnicity matters for a very long time. Culture matters, ethnicity matters, and these things will matter for a long time, and they might actually be very good for the country that's receiving them in terms of an economic impact, or they might not be. We just don't know. And it might differ from country to country. But again, by looking at immigrants like widgets as trade, you're missing the whole point of ethnicity, which would be a very big omission when you look at the impact of immigration. And last but not least, immigrants actually do have factory, do have lives outside the factory gates. When a widget breaks down, we pick it up and throw it out. When an immigrant gets sick, we don't do that, and we should never do that. So we have to realize that these, the fact that immigrants are people are going to have human consequences that might affect the economy in many, many other ways, the most obvious of which is the welfare state. And depending on the costs and benefits, it could be very beneficial if immigrants pay their way through the, through the system and help fund my retirement, for example, or it might not work that way out. It might not work out that way. Uh, all right, so uh, a few years ago, Paul Collier, who's a, de a development economist, decided to write a book about immigration. And the book is entitled, Exodus, How Migration is Changing Our World. Now, Collier, in his academic work, had never really written anything on immigration at the time. He'd done work on development, on, the, um, on global warming, I believe, all kinds of things really unrelated to migration as a direct topic. But he decided to write a book on migration, out of the blue, I guess. And, um, you know, the book, you might like it or you might not like it. I don't really, I don't, I'm not here to push the conclusion of the book. He basically says that economists tend to overestimate the gains from migration. But that's not really what's really important about the book. What I found fascinating about the book was the perception of reading the social science literature on immigration from somebody who had never really worked on it. So it's just like starting from scratch. What do you see when you read the papers that, that people have written on immigration? And he has this quote that is really very insightful as to what he found as he read the literature. And the quote basically says, there's a lot of people out there who are very anti-immigrant, and no doubt about it, there are a lot of people out there who are very anti-immigrant, and they argue that migration is bad for the, for the native population. And understandably, this has triggered a reaction. Desperate not to give succor to those people, social scientists have strained every muscle to show that migration is good for everyone. Okay? Now again, this is somebody who's never worked on migration, reads the literature, and gets the narrative. And that is the narrative. Social science has created a narrative where, through many ways, they will tell a story. And the story is that migration is good for everyone. And how do you do that? Uh, well, you do that in many ways. You do that by ignoring the distinction between workers and people. That's one way you do that. You, know, you, you only focus on the contribution of immigrants to product, national product, and ignore all the other possible consequences. You do that by making assumptions. And I will show you a couple of examples about that. Okay, you make assumptions, and believe me, you know, given a set of assumptions, you can end up wherever you want to end up. And if you don't end up in the right place, you can make a different set of assumptions and end up where you want to end up. And last but not least, you overlook inconvenient facts. So again, there's a lot of data out there, some data will tend to push this perspective. Some data will tend to push that perspective. 
you focus on the data that is sort of comes out the right way from your point of view. And you see that over and over again in the literature. Okay? And I've worked on this now for like over 30 years, and you know, it's noticeable how the literature has changed by these, way, by these sort of choices that researchers make uh, into sort of stressing a narrative about immigration. And it's particularly true about outside economics, but it's also true in economics to some extent. All right, so I want to start with an example of what I mean by that. And the example I want to start with is, uh, well, I have a whole bunch here, but I want to start with the one with the, with the first one. But these are, the, these are the narrative. Open borders are good. Open borders will solve the world's poverty problem once and for all. And you hear that from some groups, and that's part of the narrative. Open borders are good. Uh, immigrants have a small impact on labor market opportunities of native workers. And again, the word small always appears. I mean, look through the papers, look through the academic studies, somehow that adjective would always appear. No matter what the number is, it's small, because that's the narrative. Uh, immigrants create huge benefits for the nation's economy. And I'll give you an example of that later. That's also part of the narrative. And immigrants and the welfare system, we don't have to worry about it. It's at least neutral. In fact, they could probably fund our retirement when, we, when the baby boom retires. That's also part of the narrative. I'm going to go through all four of these things, actually, okay, and show you how the narrative is built and uh, you know, what it all, what, how it all fits together. And I'm going to start with the first one, the open borders one. And uh, there was a paper by Hamilton and Wally back in the 83, 84, something like that, published, which was the first paper that I know of that did this. And they wanted to find out, basically, you know, they tried to pick up on John Lennon. Imagine there's no countries, right? And imagine there's no countries, and John Lennon wrote, it isn't hard to do. Uh, and I'm a huge Beatles fan my whole life. I, I have all kinds of Beatles memorabilia at home. I hate to admit it, but I, I've saved it all. Uh, I have a copy of the Butcher album, if you know what that means. So I have all that stuff at home, and I'm a huge Beatles fan. I hate this particular song. I think it's stupid. But nevertheless, John Lennon wrote it. And uh, he says, imagine those countries. It isn't hard to do. Uh, even, if you, even, if you, even if you agree with the whole, the whole sort of narrative of that song, uh, the, the fact that he says it's not hard to do, it isn't hard to do, is complete nonsense. That's very hard to do. I mean, it involves very complex mathematical models to imagine there's no countries. Anyway, Hamilton and Wally wrote this paper back in 83, 84, where they imagined there's no countries within the context of a model. And they said, what would happen to world GDP if there are no countries? And they came up with a really shocking answer. It's a nice paper, by the way. You know, it's a very creative paper. Great question to ask. And again, think of a, one more thing I want to add. There's really no data to estimate that, right? I mean, we've never had open borders. So when, you know, how exactly would you get data to predict what would happen if we had open borders today? So there's no data. So it's all model-based. You know, you draw supply-demand curves, you shift them around, you look at triangles, rectangles, add it all up, you come up with a number. And that's what Hamilton and Wally did. And that's a number in, that's not a number in their paper, but that's an updated version of the number. If you were to get rid of, if you were to get rid of borders today, you basically would get an increasing world GDP of 40, 40 trillion dollars. Now, world GDP at the time of 2013 was on 70 trillion. So you're talking about like a 50, 60 percent increase in world GDP. You know, there, some people have claimed there are trillion dollar bills lying on the sidewalk if we were just smart enough to pick them up and get rid of borders. That is the number stressed in the Hamilton Wally paper. Again, a smaller number because they did it way long time ago and different model, whatever, but that's basically the number. It's a huge gain in world GDP if we get rid of borders. Now, when you do models in class, in economics, you realize that when you start shifting curves, you get triangles, rectangles, and all kinds of areas to look at, right? And you get a whole bunch of numbers coming out. Hamilton and Wally, like everybody else who sort of followed up on this, tends to focus on one number, that number, huge increase in world GDP. But in fact, there's a whole gray area there. You see the gray area I put in that hides other numbers that are sort of ignored. 
So I'm going to open up the little black box and show you all the other numbers that are ignored by everybody else. And these are all the numbers that are ignored, OK? And I want to focus on the second number. Uh, population in the world is 7 billion people. Uh, to get 43, 40 trillion dollar gains, you have to move 5.6 billion people. Okay. Now, the Hamilton and Wally paper does not mention that number at all. It's completely, you know, put under the carpet. Not in a footnote. Not in the appendix. Nothing. That number is not mentioned. Now, once you mention that number, it puts that gain in a very different context. And that's the way the narrative is built. You overlook inconvenient numbers. You overlook that it takes almost the migration of 6 billion people. Almost the whole world has to move from the south to the north, or from the poor countries to the rich countries to achieve that. And there's also a huge wage change, right? You know, you're going to equalize the wage. There's going to be huge grain for the people in the south, a huge drop for the people in the north. That's also ignored. And uh, one last thing I want to point out is that the original Hamilton Wally paper ignored the fact that you just don't move people around for free. You have to pay something, you know, it costs something to move. But the fact of the matter is that if you even take account of migration costs, it's still 28 trillion. It's a huge gain. But now, this, by, by the way, I'm not asking you to believe any of these numbers. This is a, this is a model. And I can change assumptions any way I want. And that's what I'm going to do for you. To sort of show you how sensitive these things are to whatever assumptions somebody chooses to make. And believe me, the immigration context is so politicized that the choice of assumption should be examined very, very carefully. Because it's not random. They're not random assumptions people make. OK? So just think about it. Can you really expect to move 6 billion people and have the North, the rich countries, unchanged as a result of that? Or will there be externalities that make the productive advantage of the North you know, less than it used to be. So again, you can play games. And I do that in the next slide. I can say, suppose there are no spillovers, or suppose there are spillovers. I can make that positive number of 28 trillion into negative very, very quickly by changing assumptions. Now, again, I'm not asking you to believe any of these numbers. What I'm asking you to sort of realize is that all these claims of all these gains are based on a model that people have cooked up and made assumptions about. And if you make this set of assumptions, I can come up with another set of assumptions that will lead to exactly the opposite conclusion. So there's nothing here that's really scientific. It's all playing a game, imagining, in the John Lennon's words, with assumptions that a, research in, that a researcher imposes on the model. OK? Now, I'm going to keep showing you that over and over again. Let me give you the next example I want to talk about, supply and demand. Uh, the loss of supply and demand. Supply of oil goes up, the price of gas goes down. Few people here would disagree with that. <laughs> We've now lived through enough OPEC kind of events and you know, shot the oil supply being cut off and stuff like that that we all know that to be true, intuitively. Now, what I want to show you is a quote by Paul Samuelson. If you were my age or a little younger and you went to college at the time of the baby boom, the Paul Samuelson textbook would be the book you would have used in Econ 101, OK? I used it. And I know that people now use something like Manc or something like that. But Paul Samuelson's textbook would have been the one you use in Econ 101 back then. And what I did was to go to the textbook edition published in 64. And I chose that year on purpose. Because 1965 immigration policy in the US changed which led to the regime we're in now. Much larger immigration, family preferences, all that stuff, that law passed in 65. So Samuelson is talking about a world that's very different from the world we live in today. Okay, A different immigration policy. And he says, in 64, after World War I, laws were passed that limited immigration, which is true. Remember the, long, the big migration wave in the early 1900s? Ellis Island, you know, the usual movie that shows up like that. We reacted to that by cutting immigration in 1924 or so. And only a trickle of Americans have been admitted since then, which is true. You know, between 24 
1965, there was very little immigration to the U.S. Now, Paul Samuelson is one of the premier economists of the 20th century. Somebody asked me last night what's my favorite, my most influential book I've ever read, and I actually, my answer was uh, uh, No Six Anarchy State and Utopia, which is true. But if I, somebody were to ask me what's the second most influential book you've ever read, I would say the first half of Samuelson Foundations of Economic Analysis. I mean, that really showed to me the way that economics should be made when I was a graduate student, okay? And anyway, so Samuelson is not somebody who, so it's somebody who knows economics really, really well. That's what I'm trying to say. And he says, by keeping labor supply down, immigration policy keeps wages high. Supply and demand. Same thing as the price of oil kind of stuff at the, at the beginning. Now, let's suppose we take Samuelson's words and change him slightly to the way the world is today. He would then have written saying something like, after 1965, laws were passed that severely or that greatly liberalized immigration, which is true. A huge number of immigrants have been admitted since then, which is also true. By keeping labor supply high, immigration policy keeps wages low. You go out in public today and say that, and the Twitter mob will be after you in five minutes. And you might lose your job by the end of the day. Okay? Uh, so despite the sensible intuition behind this, that prediction is highly disputed in the immigration context. Now I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples. I want to see if this is really true or not. And the best way to see if this is really true or not is to forget data and look at what people actually do. So this is what I call supply and demand in real life. And in September 2006, George Bush was trying to push through an amnesty of undocumented immigrants. And to show his uh, sort of like credentials in this field, he put uh, immigration enforcement at a high level. And a lot of firms were you know, raided at the time. This is all from the Wall Street Journal, by the way. This is all from the Wall Street Journal article published about this particular event. And uh, in September 2006, in Labor Day weekend, that enforcement action led to the raid of a firm in Georgia called Kreider, which is a chicken processing plant. During Labor Day weekend, 75% of Kreider's workers were either arrested or disappeared. So just imagine, Kreider is, you know, on Friday, all these chickens, processing chickens, the raid comes in on Labor Day weekend, by Tuesday morning, Kreider has lost 75% of its workers. What's the manager to do? I have a quote there from Samuel Johnson, which is one of my favorite quotes too. And it says, when a man knows he's about to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. And that's what this manager did. The fact that you have no workers to open up on Tuesday morning and the fact that you have all these chickens to be processed that will go to waste unless and lose a lot of money unless you take care of it, what do you do? Well, what you do is you put an ad in the paper. And that's the actual ad in the paper that came out in the local paper. And look at the headline in the ad, increased wages. Not lower wages, not we have our jobs available, we're paying you more. That's what they're trying to say. Supply goes down, wages go up. And that's supply and demand in real life, okay? Uh, another example of this, Marielle, okay? I got involved in this a, a four years ago now, and I wrote a paper because the Marielle influx into Miami in 1980 let in a lot of low-skilled workers. And uh, the original paper, and this is a wonderful paper by David Card, very influential paper. And he had to look basically at the average wage or the wage of particular groups but he had never really looked at the low skill wage, which means that he really maybe had missed a point. Because most of the Mariel refugees were high school dropouts, something like two thirds, a little bit under two thirds, I think, were high school dropouts. So I woke up one morning and I said, well, what happened to high school dropouts? And this is what I found. This is what happened to high school dropout wage in Miami as a result of Mariel. And I defined, and, and the sample I looked at, is male non-Hispanic high school dropouts who are prime age, 25, 59. In labor economics, you pick that sample up, and nobody will bat an eye. 
sort of a standard sample people tend to use. I've used it in many of my papers, actually, OK? And uh, no, needless to say, this is a very different pattern of the weights in Miami than what David Carter found. And this topic has now become so contentious that as a result of this paper, there's like a little, a little resurrection of my real research with paper after paper seeming to come up every other day. Okay, and a lot of the papers have very conflicting answers. And I want to show you what I mean by that. So uh, three months after my paper came out publicly, another paper came out where they looked at a different sample. And you can basically see my le the left panel is my paper, you know, non-Hispanic, men age 25, 59. The right sample is a different paper that came out three months after, non-Cubans, age 1661. Okay? Now, this is actually very disturbing, because if you look at the headlines of these two graphs, there's really nothing obviously wrong with either of these samples, right? But it makes a huge difference on the, on the, on the finding, a huge difference. Lesson, very important lesson to remember, the data can be manipulated to get whatever answer you want. And unless you know the very subtleties that go into these definitions, there's no way you're going to find out which of these two things is correct. And in fact, neither might be. There's other samples that will lead to different things. But just to give you an idea of the subtlety of this, one of the things that's really crucial in those two graphs is the age of the sample. In my graph, the left one, I looked at prime age workers, persons outside school for sure. And the reason I did that is because if you look at the wage of you know, people who are in school, it's like a summer job or something, right? And it's not really the same thing. And the CPS, the source of this data, doesn't tell you if people are in school or not. So we don't have that data. So we cannot just select people who are not in school. So I just did it by age. The right panel includes people who are 16, 17, and 18. Now, we don't know if they're in school or not. What we do know is that they're high school dropouts, quote unquote, high school dropouts. Now, what does that mean when you're 16 and you're high school dropout? The way it's defining the data is, is somebody who's 16 years old who doesn't have a high school diploma. Okay, think of who is 16 and doesn't have a high school, doesn't have a high school diploma. A high school junior is 16 and doesn't have a high school diploma. So the right panel includes all the high school juniors and all the high school seniors in the country. Now, is that what you really mean by high school dropouts? Is that what you really mean to look at when you look at the impact of Marielle? Maybe, maybe not. It makes a huge difference on the answer. And there's so many of these high school juniors and seniors that they totally overwhelm the data. And that's what's going on there. That's all that's going on. Now, I'm going to show you more example of that. And it's fake news, like, like you know, the popular phrase today. But it's actually a little, a little deeper than that. Because it tells you that a researcher can manipulate the data, number one. And it also tells you that you, as a reader, can choose who to believe just on the basis of what you like to see. And that's what you see all the time in the immigration debate. So you can pick whatever result you want and push that one. And I'll give you more examples of that in a minute. Now, one of the reasons that people worry a lot about the impact on the wage is that, again, if you take an Econ 101, the Soto Samuelson kind of phrase, uh, quote from before, you'll realize that you get these graphs, you get rectangles, you get triangles, you add them up, and you can actually estimate from the model what the gain to immigration is for the native population. That's called the immigration surplus. And I did that. I've done papers with that. And this is actually the latest set of estimates as of uh, 2015. So the immigration surplus, the first row, is the number that tells you, given how many immigrants we have in the US, what would a supply demand framework predict? In the absence of externalities, what would a demand supply framework predict as to how much wealth rose for the native population? And native population means workers and firms, right? So you know we get more immigrants, they get lower wages, the wage goes down. I'm sorry, they, the, we get more immigrants, the wage goes down. It creates a gain for the country as a whole. How much is that gain? $50 billion. You see that number push around a little bit? But again, like with the global gains to migration, 
There are many numbers that come out of that, of that, of that exercise. As I said, there are rectangles, there are triangles, and you can add them all up, and these are all the numbers that will come out of the exercise. You seldom see all the numbers reported because people will pick the one that they want to pick. But if you wanted to sort of say, what does the model say? This is what the model says. There's a $50 billion gain. Native workers and na loose native firms gain on the order of something like 500 billion. Total increase in GDP is tremendous, $2 trillion. Don't forget immigrants come in, they now make up 15% of the workforce. They don't work for free. So their, in, their, their, their contribution to total product is huge, $2 trillion. But they get paid most of that, which is why the net gain to everybody else is small. Okay? Now, in 2016, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report on immigration, sort of documenting the economic impact. And they don't have this table, but they talk about this table, more or less. Okay? And I was really curious to see how the media reacted to these numbers. Now, the National Academy, in a way, has these numbers in the report. Okay? Oops. Sorry. Sorry about that. Oh, my God. And of course, it's a telemarketer. Uh, <laughs> he knew exactly what to interrupt. Telemarketer. Okay. So uh, the National Academy has a, a, a section on this table. And I was really curious to see how the media reported this table. So the day after the Academy report came out, or the week after, I started searching the web to see how different people reported it. And I have three screenshots. And no, don't forget one more thing. If you're going to report this honestly, whether you believe the exercise or not, don't forget, this is all a model, right? So it's totally plausible to say, I don't believe it. There's nothing wrong with saying that. But if you were to believe it, you have to believe the package, not a single number. OK? Well, nobody reported the package. People reported single numbers. And these are three screenshots from three different media sources telling you what they reported. So the first one is opinion. I think that was in the Huffington, the Huffington Post. And it says, two trillion reasons why immigrants make America great. So what they're basically saying is, look at this table, and look at the fourth number. Total increase in GDP, $2 trillion. It's true. You can't say it's false. It's true. The second one, I think, was from Breitbart. They said, National Academy hides the $500 billion immigration tax in 485-page report. Now, why do they hide it? They actually have it in there. But one of the little things, you, one of the tricks you see in immigration is that when your number looks too bad, you don't report a number, you report a percent. So you don't report 500 billion, you report a percent, and then let, the reader has to take, get an envelope, the little back of the envelope stuff, and get multiply, you know, the percent times whatever, and you get 500 billion. But there, it's in the report. If you, know, if you wanted to get a pencil and do it, you can do it. It's reported. And the bottom one is from the New York Times. And the bottom one reported the $50 billion gain, basically. OK? Now, I call it fake news, part two. Again, it's very subtle. Each of these statements is correct. Each of these statements is also false, right? Because it's correct, but incomplete. The correct story is this. And depending on how you, on how you want a narrative to go, you will pick a number and ignore all the inconvenient facts that go with that number. And this is, the, this, is the whole, this is the whole package. There's nothing else to be had out of this model. You can complicate the model and in a million different ways, but if you stick to the simple split demand framework, this is what it tells you. And now you can then use your ideology to push whatever story you want. OK? All right, one more piece of fake news, immigration and welfare. And I actually love doing this graph. I do it in my class uh, when I do an immigration class. And the reason I do it in class is because I can basically cook up this graph in like five minutes using the CPS data in class, in lifetime. And it's always a shock to students to sort of start with the same data and see manipulated in a way that you end up with different answers. And 
you know, since 1994, the current population survey has basically provided information on, who, on, how, on whether you use welfare or not. And in this graph, by welfare, I mean food stamps, cash, or Medicaid. There are many other things that go into welfare, like housing and stuff like that. But to make it really simple, just focus on those three. So by definition, you get on, you're on welfare, quote unquote, if you get cash, food stamps, or Medicaid. Okay. And one of the questions that's really important in the immigration debate is, do immigrants use welfare as much or less or more than natives? And the, this is all the same data, by the way. This is the CPS since 1994. If you look at it one way, you get the graph in the left panel, which basically says immigrants use a lot more welfare than natives. If you do it the other way, you get the graph in the right panel, and it says so it doesn't really matter. It's the same. How is it possible to get two totally different graphs from the same data? And here's where you have to read the footnotes. And the, you know, what the assumptions are and the way the data are manipulated. So let me give you the story behind the left graph. Suppose you're an immigrant woman, a young immigrant woman. You come to this country by yourself. You meet a significant other. And that you, woman, and the significant other have children, say three children. And a few years later, you're a single mom with three kids. All these kids were born in the US, right? Because you came with our kids, met this other, have three kids. In the left panel, the way you do these things in the program is to say, I have an immigrant family. And if this mother is poor enough with all these children, she'll qualify for cash and Medicaid and food stamps and be on welfare. And therefore, this household is on welfare. And this household, because the household head, this immigrant would be an immigrant household. And that would be the way you define households in the left panel. You have immigrant households. You have native households. If the household receives assistance, you end up in the column. Yeah, you get welfare. If it doesn't, you don't. And you can see when you do it that way, the immigrant, the gap is actually quite large. Something like, uh, I don't know, what is it, like 37% or something like that of immigrant households are on welfare, right? As compared to only like 25% of native households. And in fact, if you do this on better data, there's a data set called the SIP, uh, the Survey of Income and Program Participation, which is designed specifically to measure welfare use. The numbers for immigrants are way bigger, something like 45% or something like that. Okay? So, that's what you get in the left panel. But I can also put a different hat on and come with the right panel. And in the right panel, I'm not going to look at the household. I'm going to look at the person. And you have an immigrant. Suppose, take this household again. This household is on welfare, right? But now you have a household where an immigrant gets welfare, and three native-born kids get welfare. I'm going to count now, at the individual level, you end up with four people. One of them ends up in the immigrant column, being on welfare. Three of them, the kids, end up in the native column, being on welfare. And you get a completely different answer. Because you've moved a lot of the kids, or the descendants of an immigrant, but born in the US, into being a native on welfare. Now, I'm not here to defend which of these two things is right. But you, it, again, it's a subtlety. And depending on who you read, either the subtlety is stressed or not. Right? Depending on what story you want to push out, either you say, well, the household level, and I'm looking at the descendants of that immigrant, or I'm doing it at the personal level, and I'm going to treat the kid that was just born from an immigrant as a native, even though he's on welfare, but he'll, he'll be counted on the native column. And depending on what you want to do, you can say whatever story you want to say. Immigrants do use welfare more, or they don't use welfare more. I mean, I wish I could bet every time I read a report on welfare and immigration, because I know what the answer will be. 
And I know that the answer will depend entirely on whether the, whoever wrote the report wants to look at it at the household level or at the individual level. And it all depends which story you want to tell. And again, I call it fake news. It's not really fake. Both of these things are true. They're both replicable. I mean, I could do it for you in five minutes with my, with my laptop, really. It takes, it takes almost no effort to, to recreate these graphs. But it's a, it's a conceptual subtlety that requires thinking and that people often hide when they report the news. Okay? Now, the National Academy did, the, the study I mentioned earlier, also did a lot of stuff on welfare. And again, I'm going to show you how different assumptions will lead to different answers. And uh, I'm going to skip this. Well, I'm, I won't skip this, actually. The National Academy, the report, had two chapters, actually three chapters on welfare and immigration, the fiscal impact. One focused on the short run, one focused on the long run. Let me, look, let me talk about the short run first. So what they did was basically to add up how, many, how much taxes immigrants pay in a year. I think they did it for like 2012, 13, and compare it to how much services they received. And they did a whole bunch of scenarios. By uh, full disclosure here, I was a member of the National Academy panel of the report, though I had almost nothing to do with those chapters, okay? But what I will tell you is that on purpose, the panel chose not to push one scenario over the other. They just have these huge tables with many possible scenarios. And the text doesn't tell you which is the right one, because based on assumptions. And uh, basically, they get scenarios where the minimum is like $57 billion shortfall. But it could go up as much as $300 billion, basically. So uh, remember the immigration surplus from before is $50 billion, right? So at best, this is going to completely offset the immigration surplus. If you look at the short run. So in a given year, there's no doubt about the fact that immigrants, you know, the, the kinds of immigrants we've received tend to cost us more than they put into the system. There's no doubt about that. And every scenario the National Academy came up with comes up with that answer. But there's actually something wrong about this, OK? And what's wrong about it is that the short run focus could be very misleading. Because a lot of the money that we spend on immigrants could actually be used as an investment. We spend money in their schooling, for example, right? On the uh, schooling of the children. But that expenditure will pay off later when they start working. They have higher wages and pay more taxes and need less, need less assistance. We pay for their health. That also will pay off later. So what you, really, you really don't want to look at these short run numbers very much. What you want to do is you want to sort of, you get an immigrant today, they pay taxes, they receive services, they have kids, we pay for their kids, but the kids grow up, the kids pay taxes, they receive services, those kids have kids, and so on and so forth, right? So you want to sort of extend this over some period of time. The National Academy did that for 75 years. So basically, three generations. And they came up with a whole bunch of scenarios as well. And this is the answer for the, from, that, from that exercise. I chose four in the table, but they have many more in the report. It turns out that this long run kind of analysis, again, is very dependent on assumptions. And there are two assumptions that you have to make that really determine the answer. The first is, what do you think is going to happen to taxes and expenditures over the next 75 years? Right? You know, if you're going to predict something over 75 years, you got to have some notion of how much Social Security will cost in 2048, of how much Medicare will cost in 2053, and of how much Medicaid will cost in 2075. The, the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, has these projections that they make whether rightly or wrongly. As an aside, more likely than not very wrongly. But that they make projections anyway. And if you, if you want to sort of like uh, see how wrong they could be, they could barely predict the number of people enrolled in Obamacare six months before the fact. So the, you know, 75-year projections are not very meaningful, but let's take them seriously. 
And that's sort of the, the first column of that table. The second column of the table is things go on in their own merry way. You know, whatever we see today, we're going to sort of increase, interpolate that into the future, and that's what it's going to be. That's one assumption you have to make. What does the future look like? The second assumption you have to make is how do you, what happens to the cost of public goods when you let immigrants in? It's certainly true that if you let one immigrant in, the cost of providing fire protection to my neighborhood doesn't change at all. That's what public good is. But what if you let 41 million immigrants in? Right? That's, it's not so clear anymore. So we don't know what's going to happen to public goods and the cost of public goods. So they made two assumptions about that. One is immigrants don't increase the cost of public goods, or immigrants increase the cost of public goods on average, like everybody else does. So it's the average cost versus marginal cost kind of distinction. And you can see the four numbers. Depending on the assumptions you make, you can either, the present value of an immigrant being admitted could either be $58,000 more in revenue than, over ta than the taxes, than the cost they, 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 that they, the cost that they cost us, basically, or it could be minus $119,000. Now, you seldom see people reporting all these numbers. I could show you screenshots again. These numbers have become popular. People tie them all the time. But you only see there are very strong positive numbers cited or a very strong negative number cited without the subtlety that the National Academy didn't put out which of these numbers is correct. They put out all these scenarios and on purpose left out the sentence, this is the one we believe. Now, different people in the panel may believe different numbers, but there's nothing official about which number is there because there's nothing you can do to select among these things. We have no clue of, what, of which of these scenarios is really correct. We have no clue. And what this, again, tells you is there's a real crisis in the immigration literature. People can manipulate the data in ways that lead to completely different answers. And the, the manipulation is very subtle and seldom stated out properly. Okay? So if one way to look at all this and say, what do we really know? You know, you'd be hard-pressed to say, we know this for sure. It depends on assumptions. You'd be very hard-pressed to actually conclude anything without getting into the subtleties of what drove you to that result. Now, having said all that, let me conclude by, uh, you know, pointing out again about the surplus and the, and the, and the cost. Basically, you get a 50, if you believe the numbers, if you read the models, you get a $50 billion surplus from immigration today. If you believe the National Academy short run numbers, the shortfall in taxes are at least that much. So the best you can say is that immigration is a net wash for the US as a whole, on average. But it doesn't mean it's a net wash for everybody. Some people gain, some people lose. And if one were, if one were to ask me what have I really learned about immigration over the last 30 years, is that it's probably not that important on average. But it's really important for some people. Some people really gain a lot. And the people who really gain a lot tend to be people who use immigrants. And by using, I mean either employ immigrants or buy things immigrants produce. People who lose a lot, people who compete with immigrants. Sort of going back to the Samuelson, you know, the Kreider ad that we saw before. You compete with immigrants, you're not going to be very happy. And that leads to us now to a very difficult policy choice. Because what does this imply about policy? Well, it all depends. It's not, immigration is not an unmitigated good. It is good for some people. It is not so good for other people from an economic perspective. And there are moral issues, there are humanitarian issues, all kinds of other issues that come into the picture. But focusing solely on economics, it is very hard to use the literature to push a particular answer. Because the answer is not really there. And the best you can do is, well, you have to, come, you have to, you have to, you have to wait which people you care about. And this is sort of the last slide I want to point out. Who are you rooting for? 
we be in a much better position in terms of the immigration debate if we admit it outright that it's really our values as to what we think about immigration that really determine what we want to do. Any immigration policy you make is not going to make everybody better off. It's going to make some people better off. It's going to make some people worse off. Just, I mean, I'll give you an example of what I mean. And I want to talk a little bit about this specific example. Let's think about the, let's think about the migration of very highly skilled professionals out of a poor country. And I have in mind a particular kind of highly skilled professional. I have in mind physicians, doctors, medical doctors. Let's talk about the migration of medical doctors out of some very poor country in Africa, say, to make the case very specific. You know, we got a lot of doctors. I mean, it's not, it can be bad for us, right? We got a lot more doctors to provide services to us. We can now get a specialty appointment in two weeks as opposed to three months, right? If you're sick, that's a very important thing to have. It's probably cheaper because so many more doctors are available to do this. So for us as consumers and for the hospitals that employ them, it's not a bad thing to have at all. Now, the doctors who are here already won't like it, right? You know, they want you to wait three months because you'll know you'll value them that much more and willing to pay them that much more. So now you already have a choice there. Who should we care more about? But actually, there's a third group to think about that people almost never think about in the immigration context. And in the case of doctors, that group comes out in the forefront. What do we say about the people left behind? I mean, one more thing. The doctors themselves are better off, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't come. But what do we think about the people left behind? So it's a poor country in Africa. We're importing their doctors. We're leaving that poor country uh, with less health professionals to take care of the population. Should we care about that? Should we care when the US and European countries impose policies or enact policies that try to drain, quote unquote, drain high skilled workers out of poor countries? Should we care about that? In the case of doctors, it's sort of the, the example where you would say, oh, yeah, I would definitely care about that. I might not care so much about programmers, but in the case of doctors, I think I would care about that a lot. And what I'm trying to say is, there are choices to be made. And these choices are not really economic choices. They're not choices that you can ever answer from a supply-demand framework. They're choices that really depend much more on what you believe we should live our lives by, what set of rules, what set of moral values we should live our lives by. And you know, I have my own set. You guys have your own set, and we will never agree on, on this and any things that differs between these things. But that's really, what, that's really what's at the core of the debate, who it is that you're rooting for when you try to make these policy decisions. Because the rooting on different groups of people will lead to different policies. And in the end, you know, what the immigration policy debate is about, even though it's obscure with all this data manipulation exercises and all these conflicting facts, what the immigration debate is really about is what kind of people, what kind of country do we really want to be? Thank you so much. And I'll take a few questions now, if there are questions. And we can do the ball or we can do the, I'll throw the ball here. Who's first? I played catch many, 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 many times with my kids when they were small. So, yeah. Oh, so you saying you're the good one? Oh, talking the ball, please. Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. yeah. You saying that you're the good one throwing up, and not me that I'm the good one catching up. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the example of the household versus the individual analysis. Um, because 
some of the discussion or the uh, narrative behind that analysis sometimes is that uh, children of immigrants, and especially the native born, they, they are by definition native, US born. So if you go into the household and your example of the single mother, who's a single mother is the immigrant, um, and the kids are born here, one of the analysis that we can make is that those kids have been building up human capital in the US. So they speak the language, they are in the system. So now, now all that is story of our assimilation that could be a cause uh, for the for the society at some levels because people are adapting and learning the how-to and the language and all the other skills. That wouldn't be the case for them. Um, they will be maybe low income or they will be in other schools with different structure, but in the sense of they being considered usage, users of uh, benefits and being included in the household immigrant, I feel a little bit, even within the logic, I will feel I don't know if that's, that will be counted as one, each one of those kids. I will count the mother, but I will count the kids as one in the household panel. Okay. So, so then I have my, I could probably, I understand what you're doing with the two uh, pictures. It's just the narrative within even changing the assumption. You also need to say, well, what is, has more logic within the, the assumptions that you make. That's what my... Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, notice that I did, not, I did not try to sell you on which of these two graphs you believe, right? I mean, I just left it to you, and I just say, every time, next time you see an article talking about immigration and welfare, look and see what the definition of the, of the unit is, and you will see that that basically determines the answer. Having said that, I will tell you the following. If you look at the National Academy report and see what they chose to do their calculations, they chose basically the household level. So all their data are, they basically chose the immigrant and all the dependent children to be the unit, regardless of where the dependent children were born. And, you know, that's the way I've done my work. That's the way the National Academy does its work. But I know other people preferred the other way of doing it. And one of the, one of the things I wanted to introduce to you is sort of the notion that you really have to be careful and pay attention to all these footnotes <laughs> because they determine the answer. And sometimes the, it's, a, it's such a subtle point that it's very easy to sort of like completely miss. Okay? Yeah. So, um, um, that's what I was getting. So as much as we all like playing catch the ball, we're actually going to use this mic for Q&A because we don't think the, the voice in that is pretty good. So any other questions? That I'll come, I'll come. Yeah, George, suppose you were giving a talk on driverless cars and you began by saying, there's these economists saying it's going to be great and we're going to get trillions of dollars of gains. And then what would you say after that? Say, but they are going and hiding the fact that there's going to be taxi drivers that will lose, and there'll be broader changes in society, so who knows, right? So driverless cars, do you give a, do you give a normal economist talk saying it's going to be great and that people who are complaining need to accept the future of progress? Or do you give a talk like this where you say, who knows? What's the question exactly then? Yes. <laughs> if you were giving a talk on driverless cars, would it be, sim would it be similarly agnostic about the overall social benefits? Okay. Um... I mean, I, I don't quite understand where you're coming from, Brian, okay? I mean, do you mean, what would I do? Do you mean, what should be done? Uh, well, where I'm coming from is you've got, you know, estimates of general benefits, and rather than for doing the normal economist thing of saying, we need to focus on the overall effects on production, and remember that distributional effects in the long run are not that important. Yeah, uh, look. Uh, yes, you know, so again, the Robert Lucas point of the thing we should be focusing on is overall economic growth yeah. and productivity, and that distributional effects and focusing on them are one of the great plagues of the world because it, le it undermines the progress that we've seen over the last 200 years. Yeah, they're, look, there they are short run effects, there are gain, there are efficiency gain effects, there are distributional effects, there are long run effects. And uh, one of the things that actually I was pointing out early this morning with the group I was in before with students is that we actually know very little about the long run effects. Like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I talked about in the labor market, 
might not be all that relevant, like all these gains could actually disappear in ways uh, just because capital is adjusting over time. And then you also have externalities. You have, you, if you get very bright immigrants coming in, that could actually increase our knowledge and produce externalities of very beneficial kinds uh, with a huge beneficial effect. Uh, but I, you know, I, I don't know. I will never, look, I personally will not use a lot of the evidence, uh, if any, to make immigration policy. Because I don't think immigration policy is about this at all. That's what, I, that's what I've learned after the, working these 30 years. I would, I would make immigration policy based only on what I think, on what I think the U.S. is about. And that is, you know, that is really at the core of the question, what kind of country you want to be. I think the numbers are really relevant in the end. Having worked on this 30 years, I'm just telling you outright, I think all these numbers are in the end irrelevant. Because it doesn't really address the fundamental question of what country you want to be. If we want to be a country that is a humanitarian country, and we want to be a country that helps poor people all over the world, which is a very commendable goal, we might be willing to pay the cost, you know, in terms of welfare costs and all kinds of other costs that such a migration policy will, 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 you know, will, will incur for us. What, what, what do we want? Yet, what's really missing in the whole debate is, what do we want? We argue about the height of the fence. You know, is it six feet, 10 feet, 12 feet? I have no idea. I, what do we want to do? What do we want immigration to accomplish for us? What kind of people do we want to be? There we go. So I'm over here. My question is, what advice do you have for local policymakers who are really entrusted with making some decisions, not only, you know, well, forget the national level, but on a state level here in Minnesota and on a local level here in our greater St. Cloud region, um, these folks are not economists. Um, so what advice would you have for them in, in, as they contemplate these decisions? Right. That's a really terrific question, okay? Uh, you know, everything that people tend to do at the national level, and you get these, you know, numbers, trillions, billions at the national level, when in fact, we know that immigrants tend to settle in a very small number of places. I mean, I forget what the exact number is, but I think something like two-thirds of immigrants are in five states, and something like half of immigrants are like in 10 cities or something like that. Uh, so at the local level, whatever you see these numbers are, if you believe them, they would tend to be really, really magnified. The fact of the matter is that until recently, immigration really wasn't spreading out over much of the country. It was affecting both beneficially and not beneficially a very specific number of places. What do you recommend for policymakers at the local level? Well, there really isn't much you can do. The Supreme Court back in the 1870s decided immigration policy was a federal thing, not to be disturbed by local action. So national policy sets a, set policy on how many immigrants we'll admit and which kinds of immigrants we'll admit, and immigrants choose to settle here and not here. We don't have a policy described the, mandating immigrants settle in particular places. They settle wherever they want, and they usually settle in places where there are other immigrants. And those are the cities that will be either the beneficiaries or bear the cost of whatever it is the migration flow you know, tends, to, tends to create. So I don't know what, I mean, the, the, the set of policy options available to local policy makers is really very limited. I mean, think of what happened to Arizona a couple of years ago, not a couple, of, but like 80 years ago, when they tried to pass legislation that would limit, would discourage illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants from going into the, into the state. And a lot of that was sort of um, found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Because again, it goes back to 1874, 1875, Supreme Court decisions that immigration is basically a federal purview and not a local purview. Uh, hello, um, quick question. 
So let's say I am a student and I want to write a research paper on the benefits or costs of immigration. And as you showed, there's a lot of different numbers that can be skewed in a way that would reflect the researcher or student's personal views. Is there a way to get data and present it in a way that removes that form of bias? Um. The honest answer is I don't know. I'm sure there must be a way. There must be administrative data on that. Uh, I don't know, okay? But uh, th there's all kinds of private administrative data that people like me don't have access to, um, which might exist there, but I don't think publicly available would be easy to find. Um. It seems to me that there might be an elephant in the room in terms of the uh, beneficiaries, and that is the, uh, the large employers who uh, want low wages. Right. And uh, if uh, you look, say back in the, uh, when the, uh, the, there were the mills in the, in, up in the, uh, Massachusetts, for, uh, and the, uh, mill, the owners brought in Greeks and uh, Syrians and others at low wages, and, and they were the winners, and the immigrants were the winners in a sense, and the, and the natives were the losers. And uh, you see that repeated, it seems to me, over and over. So the question then is, how does one uh, uh, have a uh, uh, deal with the elephants, which are the, the mill owners, if you will, right. uh, and leave them out of the picture? They might be, if you look at it from a moral perspective, you might want to raise, not you, but the question might be, what, what is their role in this, in this uh, quote, problem uh, that is faced with the losers? Well, if you look at, if you look at um, actually, a very telling employer reaction happened last summer, in the last couple of summers. Uh, you know, President Trump had all these policy things happening in immigration, some of which prevent a lot of, a lot of like, uh, seasonal work coming in to this, you know, for summer jobs. And if you recall reading newspaper articles last summer or the summer before that, uh, where employers were sort of complaining that they couldn't get the labor required to fill in the summer positions, right? And why would employers complain? Because they don't want to pay higher wages. <laughs> I mean, it really comes down to that simple matter. The fact of the matter is that uh, the supply and demand works, and if the workers are not coming in from abroad, a very simple way of replacing all these workers is to attract more workers from other places. And like Kreider did it by putting in an ad, other employers have done it too. And from the employer point of view, look, from the employer point of view, there's no doubt about the fact that immigration is a great deal. You know, those are the people who really gain the most. Some of that might trickle down to consumers eventually, but the people who really gain in the short run are the employers who are going to encounter much lower wages as a result of a supply shock. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say that immigration policy in the U.S. is broken. You hear that phrase all the time. Uh, I actually completely disagree with that. <laughs> I think immigration policy in the U.S. is the policy that employers bought. You know, through lobbying and, all, and contributions, they've bought a particular policy that benefits them, and that's what we have. I mean, think about it. Think about undocumented immigration. It's actually a very simple way right now to pretty much discourage undocumented immigration, okay? Yet we will never do it. It doesn't involve building a wall. All it involves is putting E-Verify as sort of a requirement for all hiring in the U.S. Now, E-Verify is an electronic system that when you want to get a job in the U.S., your social security card, your number will be scanned against the central records, and in, instantaneously, the employer would know whether you're a legal worker or not, you know, a citizen or, a, or you know, whether you, whether you have a, a, a legal social security number. That can be done instantaneously. It's not done. The system is available. Some states mandate it already, but why, doesn't it, why, why isn't it mandated nationwide? Because I'm really serious about it. Some people don't really want that. And who doesn't really want that? Employers don't really want that. And again, it's, it, it's a matter of it, a very simple policy to put in, very minimal cost at this point. It's not done. One last question. 
Hello? Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed. So um, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, strategic immigration policy. So you kind of get off the moral plane a little bit and just say, what are simple things we can do with immigration policy that would make sense? You have an uneven age distribution. Let more people in in the younger age groups. This will fix your age distribution. You have an uneven skill distribution. Let people in with uh, certain skills. That will fix your skill distribution. That seems like very sensible policy to me. Also, you've got changing demographics with very low birth rates relative to historically. So get your population growth rate and your labor force growth rate to be where you want it to be, let's say 2 percent. These seem like simpler strategic goals that you could have uh, for immigration policy, and you don't have to make gut-wrenching decisions about you know, the very poorest person in the world, and, and what are we going to do to help this person? There, there are simple policies, given that we agree on the goal of immigration policy. And the, the presumption under your question is that the goal should be some kind of economic gain, right? You know, if you're going to start picking up skilled people versus unskilled people, and a lot of that's usually motivated by the fact that skilled workers are better in some sense. Uh, I actually personally don't really know if that's really the correct, the correct objective function. I mean, believe it or not, I'm actually very romantic about immigration, okay? Even me and America myself. I tend to see the U.S. as a magnet to help a lot of people all over the world live the American dream. And uh, skills have nothing to do with that. So from my personal point of view, I would completely disagree with having an immigration policy that targets this group by skill versus that group. Now, Having said that, if you look at it from an economic point of view, the one, despite all these disagreements, the one thing, there's actually one thing that all these numbers agree on. And that is high skill immigration is better for the US in an economic sense than low skill immigration. There's just no doubt about that. Now, whether we should do that or not is a different question altogether. I personally would say, no, we should not do that. But there's no doubt about the fact that economic-wise, the gains from high school immigration would dwarf many, many times whatever gains we would have from high school immigration along all these dimensions. The fiscal impact will be very beneficial. They will pay for our retirement. The, the, the labor market impact will be very beneficial because they could actually introduce externalities. You know, they could bring in knowledge that we don't know. Uh, the production frontier will shift out. So you can go argument by argument. There's no doubt about the fact that economic growth will be much faster if our immigration policy was highly selective on the basis of skills. Whether we should do that or not is a completely different question. Uh, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A special thanks again to Professor George Borjas. We're going to take a quick 10-minute break and then be back for our next speaker. Thank you.